Nice to meet you guys. Nice Thanks to uh, to everyone for turning out on the rainy night. Oh God. I, I'm just going to make a couple remarks before we begin uh, and bring up our first speaker, <coughs> Mr. Don Navar from WBAI. Formerly from the actual WBAI. BI in exile. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the real BAI. There used to be a crew there, you know, and there was something happening. Anyway, um, thanks for everybody for coming out. I, I just wanted to make one remark uh, uh, before, um, if, if Les is around, um, you know, I haven't said a couple of words also. Um, we hold an event, uh, it, it's going to be necessary to um, uh, use the event as a, an organizing tool toward the next uh, step in time. Uh, nothing can happen by just protesting and going home. An organization is necessary, something that Mr. Tarpley has been mentioning uh, quite often on, on the uh, uh, various uh, channels on, on, on uh, the internet. Where, where I watch him quite regularly, nothing is possible without an organization. I, I have to say that, uh, as thinking this over, uh, the, the only organized political forces in the United States are the Democratic and Republican parties. All other, all other uh, political uh, forces appear to be completely disorganized. I, I can't think of anyone that is organized, except on a, a really small scale, or organized enough to get a bunch of people out for a, sing, a single day. There you go. They're coming in now, so, you know. The Mormon church, right. Churches, <laughs> you know, political organizations like the uh, Tea Party, uh, people of this nature. So, in order to accomplish something, it's going to have to go beyond, you're going to have to take the next step beyond uh, just people getting together for a single day to protest a vague, idea. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to get together on a regular basis. Every Friday night, we're getting together at Odessa Restaurant at 6 o'clock in the back. Have, have, have dinner and uh, come, on, come on down for dinner on Friday nights at 6 o'clock. Does everybody know where that is? It's about, uh, it's about two blocks away from here on Avenue A between 7th and 8th. Uh, the famous Odessa restaurant. At least people can get together there and discuss what the next step is toward taking this country out of, out of the mess that it's got itself into, and it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad now, a lot of nonsense going on uh, in every direction. So uh, I'm sure the speakers are going to deal with all of that. Uh, that's the one point that's necessary. The organization is going to be necessary. We need to talk a lot. We need to formulate policies. Uh, everything needs to be dealt with. The local issues, what's going on in the neighborhood. Is housing going to be a concern of this organization? The triple rents that people are paying in New York? Yes, that's going to be a concern. The international war games that are going on, the uh, constant stoking up of wars all over the planet, that's going to be a concern. There's going to be an international concern, but there's going to be a local concern. The local concern, there's a social concern, there's an economic concern. There, there, are, there are many different things that need to be put on the table for people to deal with. There, there are 10 major uh, uh, problems that can be dealt with in, in um, you know, within, within a small group of people. We've got 20 people together to start meeting on a regular basis, then we'll, then we'll really be getting somewhere. So with that aside, I'm going to say, you can't take back BAI. Okay, WBAI, the radio station, 99.5 FM. You cannot take back BAI, in my opinion, unless you take back New York. You have to start organizing uh, in the way, in some way, along the lines that we're suggesting now. Otherwise, how are you going to do it? Okay, right now I want to bring up somebody from the former BAI uh, journalist, analyst, and editor, Don DeBar. Please give a good welcome to Don. Um, I'm going to make it short and sweet. I'm going to start with what people usually end with, uh, please buy my book. <laughs> um, uh, earlier this year, I uh, was asked by Cynthia McKinney, uh, along with a group of about a dozen other people um, who had had some uh, experience with or expertise uh, in uh, the um, situation that occurred in Libya last year, uh, to contribute to a book that she was going to edit. And uh, I did, uh, I wrote two chapters, uh, one of which we ended up using, which had to do with the role of the progressive media in uh, manufacturing acquiescence among the left 
in the war that was conducted against Libya without uh, an act of Congress, uh, without any real discussion in, uh, in the uh, public sphere, and uh, without the support, according to polls, of the American people. A nine and a half month uh, bombing campaign was conducted against a country of six million people. Um, in one day, when I was in touch with uh, Cynthia McKinney while she was on the ground, she was uh, hanging out with some people from the African Union, and in one day in Tripoli, they counted from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. 80 bombing attacks. And if you think about the fact that two airplanes uh, hitting a building in Lower Manhattan, uh, Tripoli has about the same population as Manhattan, about two million people. Uh, those two planes uh, reverberate 11 years later uh, throughout our society, legally, uh, culturally, socially, um, and in many other ways. Uh, there were 80 or 40 times that uh, conducted in one day out of a nine and a half month campaign against a country of six million people. Um, the war on Libya is, I'm uh, going to discuss in some depth because it is uh, analogous to the war that's currently being conducted against Syria. And for those who aren't aware of it, the war in Syria is not an indigenous uprising against a, a dictatorship. It is a ground war being conducted by proxy on behalf of the United States um, with the support of its NATO ally Turkey on the north and uh, some of the other adjoining countries, including Iraq and Jordan. Um, the supply lines for the troops come from the West. The weapons come from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, Libya, and elsewhere. And the U.S. has been itching for many months to be able to conduct an air campaign in support of that ground warfare, similar to the one that they conducted in Libya. Uh, to date, the only thing standing between the United States and that air war has been the veto of Russia and China at the United Nations Security Council. And for that, uh, both of those countries have had to endure uh, quite a bit of vitriolic uh, rhetoric at the UN and elsewhere from Susan Rice, uh, Hillary Clinton, and other US officials. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna kinda go through the uh, outline of this book as a guideline to the uh, history of the uh, adventure in, uh, in Libya. And uh, first, I guess I want to do a little bit of history. I would point out that um, Syria has uh, something in common with uh, both Iraq and Egypt. In the late 50s and early 60s, uh, Nasser's Egypt and Syria became one nation, one uh, nation state for the last five, six, seven years. And there were hopes that it would uh, become reconstituted after they formally split in the early 60s. At that time, the uh, Ba'ath Party uh, that was in control of Syria uh, also saw the rise of the Ba'ath Party, uh, which ended up coming to power in Iraq later. And in fact, the Iraq flag of that period um, was essentially the flag of the nation state called the United Arab Republic, which was Egypt and Syria, with three stars on it, anticipating that uh, the three nations would become one. The uh, concept for the United Arab Republic came out of the, uh, the, the philosophy, the ideology of uh, pan-Arabism, the uh, hope and uh, you know, the aspiration that there would be a political unity among Arabs, uh, both to counter the insertion of essentially a European colony uh, into the area there, uh, known as the nation state of Israel, and uh, also to deal with the uh, resurgence of colonialism that uh, was represented by uh, the UK and particularly the United States entering into the uh, region uh, post-World War II. Britain had been there before, uh, France had been more or less displaced, and the United States uh, was soaking up the slack and really bringing the oil production and the exploitation of resources online there post-World War II. So um, Egypt and Syria have had a, uh, an interesting relationship over the past 40 or 50 years. And um, in uh, the last two weeks, uh, there was an event uh, on that timeline that uh, caught my attention anyway, which was the newly elected president of Egypt uh, taking the side of the United States in the uh, conflict in Syria. 
and uh, making a demand that uh, the government step down and that a transition to the uh, rebels, as they're called, uh, be affected. How many people think that the uh, uprising is taking place right now in uh, Egypt and elsewhere is the result of a movie or a movie trailer on YouTube uh, showing us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, it's a rough crowd. This, uh, this is an easy crowd. <laughs> a rough crowd would all have their hands up. The, um, I'll use Libya as an example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. As I mentioned, there was a nine and a half month bombing campaign last year. Um, probably every family in the country lost someone, you know, suffered a death or a serious uh, Injury. The infrastructure in the country had, was more or less level. Um, this was a country that had the highest standard of living in Africa and one of the highest standards of living in the uh, Muslim world. And that is a change from uh, the early 50s when it was documented as the poorest country on the planet and from the condition that existed in 1969 when uh, Muammar Gaddafi removed the uh, puppet king Idris from power and began what became known as the Libyan Revolution. Uh, by the time of uh, early 2009, just about every Libyan had their own home, owed no rent for their home, no mortgage for their home, and no property taxes for their home. Housing was treated as a human right and it was provided to every Libyan family and ultimately to uh, every uh, Libyan that came of age and uh, left their family's home. It was, that's one thing. Another was that health care was free and available to everyone in the country to the extent that if you needed care outside of the country, your transportation and your housing and health care in the United States, UK, Switzerland, wherever, was paid for by the government. Education was free through the postgraduate level, and if you could get accepted to a university abroad, they paid your bills to go there. There is now rubble where that nation state existed. And as I said, uh, most families have suffered uh, some sort of a serious loss in the last year or two. So, festering beneath the surface, um, and uh, probably more important in a country that was essentially secular, uh, than a uh, movie insulting the uh, Prophet Muhammad was uh, this most recent uh, change in the condition of Libyan people and I'd like to postulate that that is what was driving the unrest in that country. In Egypt, you've had a revolution in process since January of last year and unlike most of the uprisings in uh, most places around the world as a matter of fact, in Egypt the people have stayed uh, vigilant at a number of points where the uh, demands that they raised uh, were uh, first embraced by and, uh, and then uh, betrayed by um, the uh, uh, people in power. You had, at the beginning of the revolution, the army siding with the people and uh, not, with, uh, not firing on them and more or less enforcing the removal of power a removal from power of uh, Mubarak and, and uh, some of his aides. And as uh, the army asserted itself against the uh, people in, at various points over the last uh, year and a half, they've gone back in the street. Uh, we saw that happen after the parliament was dissolved, and we saw that happen again after the army attempted to clip the wings of the newly elected president. Now in the last two weeks, we have uh, first the elected president more or less uh, declaring a rapprochement with Israel, which is not where the center of gravity exists among the Egyptian people, and taking the side of the United States and Syria, which again is not where the center of gravity lies among the Egyptian people. And so I would like to postulate that the unrest in that country is uh, more likely tied to their dissatisfaction with the direction the government's taken over the last couple of weeks than over a 13-minute YouTube trailer in English. <clears throat> so anyway, that's just a little bit of background. Uh, in uh, Libya, 
the you saw as well, we saw in the 2002-2003 uh, Iraq War, uh, there was first a, a demonization of the, the regime, and it was interesting that this was done in Libya, because in December of uh, 2010, uh, like three months before the UN resolutions 1970 and uh, 1973 uh, were issued. Uh, there was a report that was uh, finalized for the United Nations uh, on the uh, human rights conditions in Libya that gave a very, very favorable report. And almost every marker, including the material ones, uh, some of which I just described, uh, the uh, commentary from uh, a number, or I would say the majority of different representatives of different nations, members of the uh, United Nations General Assembly, gave positive uh, review of the situation on the ground in Libya. From December until February, apparently there was a change of heart in the Libyan government that it went from being uh, the uh, sponsor, essentially, of these major changes of the period from 1969 to 2010, uh, turning into a monster that bombed its own people, uh, shot its protesters in the streets. There was an accusation uh, brought to the United Nations that uh, 6,000 people had been murdered in uh, Benghazi and Braga, and um, the things of this uh, nature were being floated. And the response uh, to this, which was delivered, by the way, in a wall-to-wall -wall manner across the Western media, uh, on the one hand from Fox, all the way out to Democracy Now!, Free Speech Radio. Uh, that The narrative was the same. The Libyan, Gaddafi's crazy, the Libyan government is tyrannical, they're killing their own people, they're a threat to their own people, and something needs to be done about it. And uh, so, we have uh, at least two tracks that were followed that have been documented subsequently. One is the track that was reported you had activity at the United Nations that resulted in resolutions declaring a, a sanctions and a no-fly zone. Um, and that was in uh, mid-late March, I don't remember the dates. However, <laughs> on a separate track, which for some reason uh, could not make its way into the media in this country, uh, despite the efforts of a number of people, myself included, to uh, deliver it, was the fact that the United States the UK and France had landed troops in Benghazi on the 23rd and 24th of February, a month and change before the UN resolutions. That was first reported in the Pakistan Observer, the English language daily in Pakistan, and uh, repeated elsewhere in, uh, in some foreign media. Um, it was delivered by me personally to Democracy Now! In, uh, on the 25th and again the 28th of February and again several times over the course of March. And, and it never was re referenced or referred to. And the other was the fact that the Russians had provided satellite surveillance information addressing the claim that was presented to the United Nations that Gaddafi or the Libyan military were uh, strafing and bombing protesters from uh, the air. And the Russians, after this was presented to the United Nations, presented uh, first just a statement of fact that we've been watching and that's not true, and then the actual documentation that showed on this date, at this time, these are the pictures. So while the uh, wheels were turning at the United Nations, um, which were, and when the resolutions were adopted, they were shortly followed by the announcement by uh, President Obama of a no-fly zone, which immediately became a preemptory bombing campaign, which turned into a nine and a half month bombing campaign, a logistical support for the quote-unquote rebels, and uh, as I said earlier, ground troops, which actually predated all of that. You also had a wall-to-wall -wall propaganda war uh, targeting primarily the American people and also the Libyan people. There were a number of uh, independent reporters on the ground at, at the time. In fact, I'm going to digress for a minute. I was in Tripoli in October of 2009 
and uh, uh, Cynthia McKinney had asked me to go uh, with a delegation that she had assembled that included Wayne Madsen, uh, the uh, journalist and uh, former intelligence specialist, uh, Bob Fetrakis, a journalist from Ohio, and uh, he was, I know him from his involvement with Harvey Wasserman over the uh, Ohio election fraud in 2004. But he's a very active uh, journalist, professor of political science, and uh, he ran for governor or something, and a Green Party candidate in Ohio also. Um, and uh, uh, Greg Ford from Black Agenda Report, um, and a half dozen other journalists and uh, academicians and activists. And I, when I walked around Tripoli uh, for a good three days with my video camera, just documenting things and talking to people and such, and the concept of Libya as a police state, to anyone that actually spent any time there, is laughable. Um, the, there were so few police, as a matter of fact, that it was dangerous to cross the street without looking five ways. They really didn't have sufficient police resources to uh, monitor red lights in the city of Tripoli, uh, let alone to monitor the activities of all of their citizens. <clears throat> so anyway, um, ha having uh, known the, the members of, of the group that I went with, and Cynthia took two other groups to Tripoli in the intervening period up to the time the war started, and there were some other journalists. When people went in and stayed there during the war, uh, I knew some of them and I was in contact with them and uh, through them I met several other journalists, in particular uh, Mahdi Nazamaraya uh, from Canada and uh, Lizzie Phelan from the UK, who stayed on until the very end of the uh, fall of Tripoli. And we were in touch over Skype and uh, Facebook and they were sending me uh, video and other information. <clears throat> and while the United States and Al Jazeera, the Qatari um, news agency, for those who don't know, <clears throat> uh, Al Jazeera is uh, controlled by the Qatari monarchy, which is essentially a medieval monarchy. And by that I mean, if you were going to compare it to Great Britain, compare it to pre-Magna Carta Great Britain, in terms of the power of the uh, monarch in uh, Qatar, uh, similar to the situation in Saudi Arabia. Um, the uh, Qataris uh, were arming the Libyan uh, uh, rebels, quote-unquote, and they also were providing uh, the actual uh, troops for the takeover of Tripoli. They had uh, troop transport ships in the harbor in Tripoli in the uh, invasion of uh, Tripoli. But um, in any event, targeting the Libyan people, the Libyan press was uh, taken down uh, almost uh, every other day uh, by bombing attacks, by um, terrorist attacks. And so the only source of information people in Libya had about what was going on in their country was from foreign uh, news sources, including Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya. And they were, like the media here, reporting wall to wall uh, this incessant march across Libya of the uh, soon to be victorious indigenous resistance to the dictator Gaddafi. While that was being reported, and while reports were coming to us of uh, uprisings in Tripoli on July 1st, there was a demonstration documented, videotaped, where almost the entire population of the city of two million, more than a million people, filled the Green Square demonstrating support for their government and for what the uh, structure there was called the Jamaria. And uh, that wasn't reported even anywhere else in Libya because the local infrastructure was taken down. Uh, what was reported instead were uh, pictures that were shot in Qatar of supposedly Green Square in Tripoli showing rebels uh, shooting, then <laughs> I was talking to somebody outside before, one of the most uh, common videos that they'd have would be six or seven guys with one or two rifles and some smoke in the background. And this, you know, there would be uh, some Arabic uh, text at the bottom of it and then an explanation that this was uh, the group that had just taken over this town or this uh, part of this city. And something you could, we could grab a half dozen people now and go stage <clears throat> on any dead end street. <clears throat> in the metropolitan area, it would take 20 minutes to do it. 
So the, the, uh, the, the war was conducted essentially not just with the bombing and with the uh, troops, but it was an information war, and that was uh, the point that I wanted to make. And that's the parallel to what's going on in Syria today. Uh, most people in the United States don't know uh, very much about Syria. They don't know that it borders uh, Turkey, Jordan, Israel, Iraq, you know, and uh, Lebanon, for example. That it sits right in the middle of all of this stuff that's going on in that region. Uh, they, they may know that um, it's a line, uh, or that there's an alliance with uh, uh, Iran, because Iran is also uh, public enemy number one again uh, this week as it has been on off the charts since 19, uh, 1979. Uh, some may or may not know that the uh, only um, port outside the old Soviet Union for the Russian Navy still exists in the northern, uh, it's in uh, Tartus in uh, Syria, which provides them access to the Mediterranean. <laughs> and uh, probably very few know the history I recited before of the relationship of uh, Syria to Egypt and Iraq historically over you know, the period post-World War II. Uh, what they do know, or what they've been told, is that Bashar Assad is a brutal dictator, um, that uh, he kills his own people, that the killing that's going on in that country right now is the government killing the citizenry, and that the Russians and the Chinese are blocking the United States from uh, intervening uh, for humanitarian reasons to put an end to the bloodshed. The facts are, of course, quite different. The bloodshed is being conducted on behalf of or directly by uh, the United States, France, and Britain. Uh, the purpose is to remove Assad. Uh, the geopolitical reasons are obvious to uh, block the Russians from uh, using TARDIS as a port in the uh, coming period and um, to deprive Iran of an ally as they move towards Tehran. Uh, we saw back in the uh, you know, early uh, 2000s that uh, they were on the list. We had the uh, list that our uh, friend was good enough, the former uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was uh, good enough to provide us that uh, listed Libya, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and so on, and uh, all of those have been in play or are threatened to be in play. And uh, right now we have a presidential election going on. We have a war that we're conducting, we have one that we just finished conducting, and no one is talking about this at all. To the extent that uh, we hear anything from Romney about Obama conducting a war illegally, uh, he uh, is upset that it wasn't uh, conducted harshly enough. Uh, to the extent that Obama is conducting a war in Syria now illegally, again, the only fault Romney finds with that is that's not being conducted harshly enough. There's some really interesting things about uh, Libya that I think, the one I'm going to uh, mention, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. October 20th of last year, two things happened. One, that was the date that Gaddafi was murdered. Um, by the, uh, by the group that calls itself the NTC, but the agents for the United States. Uh, when Hillary Clinton said, uh, we came, well, we saw he's dead, which is kind of different from what she said last week. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that happened on that date was that a lawsuit that was brought by uh, Dennis Kucinich and nine other members of Congress uh, seeking to uh, impose uh, constitutional and uh, statutory authority on the president who was conducting an illegal war. That lawsuit, which was brought in May, um, was dismissed on the same day. Now, <coughs> the suit brought by members of Congress saying the president is illegally conducting a war should go on an express track through the courts so that it's in this, at the Supreme Court almost immediately when you have such, uh, you know, heavy, um, uh, you know, material consequences involved. And what happened instead was the government stalled and delayed and made a counter summary motion for dismissal that the court, rather than ruling on so that it could go up and end up uh, being judged on the merits at the U.S. Supreme Court level, they sat on it so that it became moot. And on the day that it became moot, they dismissed the case. 
I didn't think that's a coincidence. The case was five and a half months old. And um, to me, it shows, first, the fact that Congress never got involved outside of these 10 members, that there's been a complete abdication of uh, congressional oversight with respect to uh, you know, war-making. And I know that's not a shock to most of the people here, but it is a fact that needs to be repeated. And it should be a major role in congressional campaigns. And I bet you, out of uh, however, 435 uh, you know, House seats and however many Senate seats are up this year, that very few are going to even mention more powers. But um, that is already a major deterioration from what happened in 2003, because as you'll recall, they went through the motions in October of 2002 before they invaded Iraq. And at this point in time, they don't feel the need to do that anymore. At least this president doesn't. And as I said, we are now involved in a war in Syria, and again, the Congress is not involved, and it's not an issue in the campaign. And outside of uh, making a number of reports that are intended to incite support for quote-unquote humanitarian in, uh, intervention, you don't hear anything about it in the media either. I think that puts on the agenda a task for us, um, because if we can live with that condition, we really aren't going to be living that much longer. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Oh, oh, um, well, the, okay, there, it, 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 question? Yeah, uh, that, the question was, you, you don't understand why I said it became moot um, on October 20th, basically. <clears throat> uh, okay, you have um, uh, in the law the doctrine of mootness. If you bring a lawsuit um, to stop someone from doing something, and even if you're right, they don't have the right to do it, um, if you get to the point what, that it's actually done, they'll dismiss the case because you know the, the, that part of the case is moot. At that point in time, they had, you know, at least to the extent they claim they have, uh, they had already conquered Libya and, and really the mission of that was regime change. They had killed Gaddafi. So that to me was an interesting uh, coincidence. As a matter of fact, just on that point, uh, I, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but in fact, the, the, the government, quote unquote, of Libya does not have control of the country. The government still cannot hold a press conference in Tripoli, except at the airport, with the army surrounding the airport. There are a number of cities in the West that are under the control of uh, the loyalist forces, they call them pro-Gaddafi forces, whatever, the green resistance they call themselves, who are in effect the Libyan national resistance. Uh, we're not hearing about that, but it's going to be interesting to see the role that that plays in uh, the shaping of the country over the next period. So. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. What particular detachments of the United States Army had been uh, deployed to Libya? I don't know the answer to that. You don't know? No. Any proof of these detachments? I'm just telling you about the news reports, which never made their way into the media here. From Pakistani news or what? Pa yeah, Pakistan observer. What is observer. the source of this news? What is the particular I guess I guess you could check that with them. I mean, I, I assume you're asking the question and you were laughing before because you don't believe that it's true. So I'd like to know, well, and what is the source of your information? I have the sources in the United States, the Department of State, and the United States, Department of State. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> that, that, of course, is the most credible that there is. Okay, any other questions? Yes, neither of you prove it. Oh, yeah, no. Neither of you prove it. It's an open point. Right. Well, all, all I did was say that the United States uh, was that they reported that this happened, and I believe that it did. Um, but that's you know that's that. Other questions? Yes. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, outside a few enlightened people that go to the internet or have access to say uh, oh, Russia. This guy right here. This info is right. Yeah. Let him ask his question. What? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, Please okay. continue, sir. Okay. Outside, you know, uh, outside, almost forgot. Uh, outside a few, you know, uh, people that seek the news uh, from sources on the internet, or like uh, Russia Today has some broadcast uh, um, 
outlets now like Dish TV and Comcast. Uh, we have what we call a, uh, you know, the mainstream media, which has been discredited, and most people are very suspect of what they broadcast. But then we have something called the alternative media, which takes the guise of Link TV, Free Speech TV, Pacifica, <laughs> Democracy Now! Right. And uh, most people think maybe they are getting an alternative source of news about the world from the so-called alternative sources. And it's been uh, my observation in observing, especially uh, Democracy Now!, that they are complete shields for uh, NATO aggression in Libya. Uh, Amy Goodman uh, doesn't miss the chance to get Hillary Clinton uh, on the microphone when she can to give her a nice long side sound bite, or Susan Rice, or even uh, Amy Goodman started a report on Syria with John McCain right. calling for intervention. Uh, how, how can uh, what it what it would a, a group organized do to uh, 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 educate, uh, have teach-ins or whatever, uh, to uh, what used to be called the anti-war movement uh, about this background noise that you have to shut out? Uh, well, this is perfect because it gives me an opportunity to going to say, buy my book, The Little War on the Beach, our book. My chapter actually is entitled Radio Pacific is Descent from Voice of the Voiceless to Partner in the Imperial Information War. It's 20 pages. And essentially what I did was document the coverage uh, from Pacifica, Democracy Now!, um, the Free Speech Radio News, uh, Al Jazeera, and uh, two, I selected two of the uh, uh, morning programs. That was uh, the uh, Wake Up Call here in New York, which I was the former uh, news headlines director for. And um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ian uh, Masters from uh, KPFK, who also airs uh, over uh, the airwaves here, and compared the reporting that they had with the timeline of facts that um, has come out uh, since that stuff was being reported, and show the vector from the factual uh, you know, events that were happening in the country uh, and the reporting that was taking place um, at Pacific Radio and uh, at Democracy Now! and others wherever else they are, you know, they're carried. Because both Free Speech Radio News and, and Democracy Now! are carried outside of Pacific as well. The, um, you know, in terms of your question, uh, what can be done to organize against it, I think the most important thing is to not so much focus on what they're doing, but to, you know, try to provide alternative information so, and to make it available to people and find a way of delivering it so they actually see it um, to you know bring the facts to people as quickly as possible because the strongest argument you can make generally is one that's based on facts and presenting facts to people um, it tends to uh, sort of be a magnet at some point and people see over time that what you reported turned out to be true and what they've been listening to turned out to not be true after a while, they come around. We are, in fact, um, a number of us who are former producers from Pacifica Radio, Bernard White and myself, uh, and a number of others, uh, running an internet uh, a radio network called CPR Metro. It's uh, Community Progressive Radio, and it's uh, CPRmetro.org on the internet. I do a three-hour morning show every day, which I'm going to have to leave soon to prepare for. And um, uh, we have a, an awful lot of voices from all over the world that provide additional information. So. Anyone else? I just wanted to say that we, we're a, a society that sits there and lets information come to us. We've got to learn to go and ask for information from various sources. We, don't, we cannot sit there and let it flow over us. We've got to ask. We've got to become a democracy which asks right. questions. And we sit back like... Consumers. Um, we're used to consuming. Yeah. Okay? Yes? See, that's the problem. No, you know, when, when you have an open society, then um, you have evidence. Everyone, see, you know, I mean, this is a rather ghoulish, uh, you know, 
thing to have as a subject matter of the discussion, but you would have the body available for inspection rather than you know ferreting it off at night and dumping it in the ocean, which is what they said happened. So when you have already uh, a media that polls at you know 30 percent of 40 percent tops uh, as being trusted by the you know, people who rely on it for their information, and then you manage events in that way, you leave people like us saying, well, I don't know, did, did, he, did he die of kidney failure 10 years ago? Are there five Osama bin Ladens? Or was there no Osama bin Laden? Is he really a member of the Bush family? You know, <laughs> CIA. And, and nobody can prove any of it. And, and, and I think that's the point of what they do. They have a very elastic narrative because there are no touchstones of facts and, and evidence and uh, to the extent any evidence exists, there's no uh, chain of custody for the evidence, so anyone really can reconstruct what happened after the fact. I don't think that's an accident, but, but uh, it is one of the things we have to struggle with. Yeah, I see somebody's hand back in. Yes, hi. I'd like to present this uh, question to you, Mr. Bob. It seems like the UN is like a you know, phantom agency where, according to the UN, Charles Taylor, one of the things they want to do is have a war against another nation. You would need some type of security council resolution approving it or as an act of self-defense. Today in the media, you, you hear all this talk about Israel preparing to bomb Iran, which would be, according to the UN, you know, against international law. But no one ever seems to talk about that in the media. So, and the same thing with the, uh, with the uh, um, US invasion of Iraq in 2003. They didn't have any UN approval, Security Council approval. So why aren't there any repercussions towards nations like the United States and nations like Israel? Why are they, if the UN is so, it's a world body, why aren't they like sanctioning countries like the United States? For actions in Israel, who plans to like bomb, um, you know, <laughs> bomb Iran, and technically, you know, according to their intel, they say that the uh, that the uh, nuclear facility at Fordo is so fortified underground that you would need technically a nuclear bomb to like basically destroy it. So you're going to use a nuclear weapon to destroy another country suspected of creating. It doesn't make any sense. To me. It really does. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, I, I can't answer your question other than to say it's you know it is obviously a function of power. Um, if the, there were, first of all, the United States has a veto power at the uh, Security Council, so if someone attempted to take an action at the Security Council, which would, you know, could lead to some military action or military sanction against the United States, it would be vetoed. Uh, that's at the front line. And secondly, of course, is the fact that where exactly are you going to assemble the military wherewithal to uh, punish the United States for one of its actions? That's the second part. The third part, and I think it's really the most important component of the, uh, component of the entire thing, is that the American people themselves apparently do not care that their leaders violate law, national, international, whatever. Really? The, the Bush administration was widely acknowledged by the American population, the American voters, only three and a half years ago as being the most lawless administration, to hear most of them talk in the history of mankind, to hear Democrats talk. Yet, when there was a Democratic Congress elected in 2006, taking uh, office in 2007, straight up through uh, the, you know, the President Obama administration, now there has not been a single action taken to hold a single one of those people responsible for those illegal acts. And in fact, where there's been any action taken, it has been to expand the powers claimed by Bush to legitimize them in, in, to the extent that that's possible in the face of the Constitution and international law. Um, and, and to commit outside of those actions uh, even more offensive acts that are even more violative of international law, like the war on Libya. Again, at least the war in Iraq had the sanction of the U.S. Congress. The war on Libya didn't even have that. And the raison for the war in Iraq, is, as full of nonsense as it was, was that there were weapons of mass destruction. They didn't even have a cause of war against Libya when they went in and blew the country up. So the problem is that there's no place to hold them accountable either here, we're not doing it, that's, that's the real problem, and uh, internationally, and so that's why they do what they do, in, in my opinion. Y yes, uh, you than you? Yeah. He just said that the American people just don't care about what the, the government does over there in the Middle East. I find it embarrassing that the only people doing anything against it are the pacifists so-called liberal left, liberal peace groups. The major anti-war movement doesn't seem to care. Basically think that they're being bought up by the American government, the ruling class. 
They're giving money. Now here, we're going to do what we want to do. Let's shut the bleep up. You know, what are your thoughts on that? It's just it's embarrassing. There's that book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. That betrays a very interesting <laughs> dynamic that deals with you know the entire uh, you know nonprofit world and, and uh, I've been thinking about, about that a lot yeah. because it's really really embarrassing that the government just do what the hell it wants and the anti war movement so called just stays quiet. And then you have, you know you also have the overlapping uh, control of uh, you know of certain civil institutions like. Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch. Then you have Su Suzanne Nocell, who came from the uh, U.S. State Department, who was you know one of Hillary Clinton's uh, you know top people. Who, in fact, when she started at the U.S. State Department, this is an interesting contrast to the game she was playing at HRW with respect to because um, she was there. Now she's at Amnesty. Um, with respect to Libya, only uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, the games that she was playing trying to discredit Gaddafi, her contact with Gaddafi took place when Nelson Mandela and Bolta were negotiating an end to apartheid. And she was there sitting at Bolta's side while Mandela had Gaddafi sitting at his side. So in any event, the, the directly, it's sort of off the time, but directly you have essentially these uh, instruments of civil society that should be pointing out to the American people that these things are happening that are firmly in the pocket of the U.S. State Department. So, I mean, in almost every area that we've got, the, the, the leadership of some of the, uh, the former anti-war groups that were mobilizing people against the Iraq War, you know, sitting on their hands once you had a Democratic president. Um, you have uh, the two groups I just described, you know, how many others just, you know, sitting on their hands and allowing this to happen. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, if you go back to uh, the revolution will not be funded, there's a dynamic that's, uh, you know, uh, unveiled there that I think pertains to this. You, you had your hand up? Yes, I wonder if you know of any treaties Russia has with Iran. Secret or otherwise? Well, obviously I don't know of any secret ones. There are treaties uh, 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 between the two countries, including, I believe, a non-aggression pact and a mutual defense pact, but, uh, but I'm not... If you asked me to respond in a couple of hours, I could research it. I don't know off the top of my head. There's a pipeline. <laughs> yes, there, there, there comes that. You then, you? Um, speaking of nonprofits, do you have any information about Doctors Without Borders participating in any pro war or you know, material statutes? Not that I know of, but but, uh, but that doesn't mean. Yeah. Okay, uh, Yes. It's called differentiated containment, the U.S. policy toward Iran and Iraq, for the CFR, July 1st, 1997. It outlines the whole entire how to do it, and, and that's how it transpired. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Okay, uh, one last. In response to the question about doctors without borders, recently uh, I was listening to public radio uh, show on three o'clock called The World, which is very pro Soros and all that. Mm -hmm. And they indeed, Doctors Without Borders was engaged in what I call the publicity stunt in Turkey, setting up a, 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 a quote unquote safe house, uh, a secret uh, 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 a unit to uh, give aid and comfort to those uh, fighting against the Syrian government. And it's being played up to and hyped up uh, on public radio. Gotcha. Same. So, same. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Great to hear Don DeBar in person. Our next speaker is an author, a historian, analyst of political and economic matters of great magnitude and uh, one of the uh, greatest minds.